I'm Dom, Director of Strategy and Experience at NetSell, and I just wanted to say a few words to get us kicked off this morning. It's kind of appropriate that we're here, as this building itself could be seen as an evolution of what was the site of the Baltic Exchange, a place that for many years coffee, sugar, and other soft commodities were traded. When founded, it was a site of great innovation in the way that business was done at the time. And here on the top floor of the building that replaced it is known as the Iris, named after the glass bit at the top. It's named after the glass dome in the previous building that stood on this site. And there is another glass lens, this one up here, that sits right at the top and is, incidentally, the only curved piece of glass in this whole building. As we look through the lens of evolution of the digital industry today, we find that there is a lot of great insight around how organizations can approach the challenge of making the most of digital technologies and ways of working. So we wanted to do something a bit different with this report. We wanted to focus on exploring to what degree digital transformation, which now, after over two decades of use, might feel a little bit old fashioned and how that's been surpassed by the concept of digital evolution. This being an approach of constant learning, adapting, and optimization of products and services and the ways that we deliver them. How might taking an evolutionary approach change how we work, what we build, how we measure, and how we relate to customers and each other as colleagues? The term evolution offers an intriguing way of thinking about digital. In the past, many investments in digital technology have been governed and approached as a one-off program of change to be justified in the whole and having an end point where that value is realized. Many projects have struggled to deliver the anticipated outcomes, perhaps due to the inherent inflexibility of that approach. This is how traditionally technology and business change programs have been funded and measured, but we wanted to know, is this still an approach that is fit for purpose today? The most successful startups from the digital world seem to use a different paradigm, focusing on outcomes and impact and reviewing how and what they measure. Constantly improving and optimizing, responding to changes in customer behavior and market conditions, thriving and leading because they can adjust and adapt so quickly. It's in their DNA, from people to processes to technology. And the world is going through a huge period of change. Of course, everyone's been talking about this a lot before, but it does feel like this is actually particularly justified in the last two to three years. Politically, economically, and on a human level, there have been extraordinary events that have driven great changes across how we live, work, govern, spend times with our families, view our lifestyles, and how we engage with brands and discover and shop for services and products. It can be difficult to know which way to turn in an economy which is buffered by inflation, supply chain disruption, failing consumer confidence and the pressure of cost of living. Constantly new channels are emerging against the backdrop of the breakdown of the traditional ones through which we used to build these relationships. This is going to need new and innovative ways to build impactful messages and meaningful relationships with our audiences and markets and measure and adapt effectively as things inevitably change in the future. It will need new approaches to technology, platforms that are extensible and open, allowing for a more flexible approach to data insights and delivery, and enabling a culture of experimentation. We wanted to try and help digital leaders navigate this environment and understand where organizations are having measurable success and doing things differently, boldly, and learn lessons from a global community that we can share. In order to do this, we have brought together three terrific partners alongside us at NetCell. At NetCell, we help our clients discover and create their digital future by delivering digital products and experiences that measurably drive business outcomes on the Optimizely platform. I'd like to thank our partners in supporting us in developing the report, Optimizely, who are helping people unlock digital potential with their leading digital experience platform. They equip teams with the tools and insights they need to experiment in new and novel ways. Site Improve empowers marketing teams to optimize their content for accessibility, user experience, and marketing performance so they can expand their brand's reach, exceed their marketing goals, and work towards a future with purpose. And our research partner, London Research, who have conducted the research for us through their extensive network of digital professionals and seek to tell a compelling story based on robust research and insightful data points. So, what have we in store for you today? Well, we'll kick off with Linus from London Research, 
who will be taking us through the headline re results from the report. What are our high level findings? What sectors are leading the way? What, where is digital evolution taking over from transformation in the enterprise? And what work is there still to do? And then we'll be followed by a panel discussion where Mike Nutley from uh, London Research will chair a session joined by some very experienced people across the digital uh, industry to help us discuss some of the main points of the report. Uh, unfortunately, well, the names are um, here. Um, unfortunately, Eva was unable to join us today, but um, we do have Dean Barker. Dean is the Global Director of Content Management for Optimizely. Uh, he's been working in content management for 20 years and has written four books about the practice in the industry. So there's Dean. Um, Kyra Kewick, who is, uh, has a decade of experience working in tech marketing, uh, making the con confusing complexity of tech simple and relatable. And I'm Dom with uh, 25 years um, experience in the industry across financial services, broadcast, not for profit. And as I say, I lead the strategy and uh, experience design practices at NetSalt. So and then finally, at the end, there'll be some time for us to network, enjoy the hospitality before we wrap up. So in preparation for today's session, uh, I've been thinking about what the key big questions could be asking, what we should be asking ourselves this month um, and in the coming months, and maybe we can refer back to today. What is the shape of digital to come? How will we share accountability, build and grow skills and capability to drive success in the increasingly digital world? How will organizations respond to an increasing pace of change, both recognizing important trends and their meaning, and by building rapidly uh, services and products that have impact in the market? How are we going to build lasting relationships with our audiences and colleagues that establish and maintain a sense of stakeholdership, loyalty, and enduring value in an increasingly challenging and unpredictable economic environment? And finally, how are we going to design our organizations and ways of treating our people that will enable the kind of futures that we want to build? So just very quickly, I wanted to mention a little bit about the report. So um, what, will, what will happen after this event? Um, you'll get your report uh, via email within a few days. Uh, we'll be engaging in deeper conversations around the topics that have come up in the report in the coming year, which we'd love you to be part of. So watch this space. Uh, and also uh, join us for the coming months as we discover what challenges and opportunities are there in shifting to a digital evolution mindset. So you'll be all glad to hear, that's enough from me. Uh, I'm now gonna hand over to Linus, who's gonna talk us through the outcomes and results of the research. It's uh, great to be presenting this research in the flesh. Haven't done this for a while, so uh, forgive any um, ring rustiness, but no, really, really fantastic to be here. We did actually a survey of more than uh, 600 businesses in, in, the, in the spring. And that, was, um, that survey was pushed out through our sister company, Digital Donut, which is the world's largest community of digital professionals. And we have associated LinkedIn groups. The, the survey was also pushed out by our uh, our partners, obviously NetSell, Optimize, the Insight Improve. And from, the, um, from those who took the survey, we narrowed the analysis down to 300 businesses. Uh, the, the requirements there were at least $50 million in annual revenue and um, some responsibility for digital development. It was a global survey. And to accompany that uh, quantitative research, we have also been carrying out a series of interviews with digital transformation consultants, with various brands as well, uh, some of whom are here today. And, and thank you for your input. So obviously the first question we really needed to ask was, was what are we talking about when we're describing digital transformation? Is that uh, is that still a term which still resonates with, with businesses? We really wanted to understand, um, I guess, digital transformation in its essence is business change driven by technology, but we wanted to see if it was still, a, I guess, a useful, um, a useful term for organizations trying to move forward. And here's a quote from Eva who sadly, as mentioned, couldn't be here today. But she says, 
she makes the point that the term has been around for more than a, a decade and that it's no longer really descriptive of the challenges organizations are facing. And, and the reason she gives and other people have given that we interviewed is that really transformation suggests that you're, you're moving from a point A to B and you've and once you reach your destination, you've done it. The transformation is done, job done. But as we know, we're really now thinking about constant iterative change of, of which we'll be hearing about more later on. As part of the survey, we asked, we asked respondents to indicate what they thought of um, as digital transformation being relevant for their businesses. And out on top came improvement of overall technical infrastructure, including automation of processes. 60% saw that as relevant for their organizations. That was followed by ongoing evolution of businesses uh, to capitalize on digital opportunities, developing new business models and platforms to build a competitive advantage preparing for a worldwide web and metaverse, which is something we've obviously been hearing a lot about in the, in the media. It remains to be seen if that's more hype than, than substance. And finally, fundamental organizational change of culture and behavior so technology can be embraced. And here we can see a, a split in those results by uh, digital focused businesses and established, established offline businesses. We obviously wanted to make that distinction in the report. There, there's a world of difference between an organization or say a retailer or financial services company that's been in existence for, de for decades and has been gradually pivoting towards digital and a, a brand um, say a fintech brand or a, an online only retailer whose very essence I guess is digitally driven and they would describe themselves as digital first. So in terms of this question in the survey we can see that established offline businesses are more focused on developing new business models and evolving their platforms to create a competitive advantage. And also, they're more likely to be focused on fundamental organizational change of culture and behavior. And I guess for a lot of digital first businesses, they may have been born as uh, digital centric, agile, and all that, all that stuff, um, which we're gonna be talking about. So at the heart of this research is really this notion that we're moving from digital transformation to digital evolution. And that's something that has come out in both the, the interviews and, and the survey and was really our hypothesis to, to start with. And given the, the, I guess, the title of this event and the research, that that's not gonna be a, a massive surprise. But I think hopefully a lot of the, the detail around that is, is where things get really interesting. This is a notion that certainly resonated with the companies we surveyed. So 68% of respondents agreed that they no longer think of transformation as businesses, but rather of constant evolution and iterative change. going to read out this quote from uh, Chris Wall, who's um, a digital consultant and former chief digital officer of Hargreaves Lansdowne, which is in the financial services sector. He says, many businesses have catching up to do from the point of view of technology, of culture, of organizational design. But transformation and the digital way of working now is about getting a business to a point where it can continue to adapt and evolve in an agile manner. I think what he's, what he's making, the point he's making is that um, he gets, and a lot of companies get, that 
we do need to move towards this more kind of iterative, agile way of thinking. And conceptually, uh, companies realize that that's the way forward, but there are obstacles and barriers from holding back businesses to, to make that happen. So this is the, I guess, the essence of the, of the findings really, is that the, what, we're, what we're finding in the research is that digitization of the main processes within business is fairly widespread. So by digitization, uh, this moving in the digital direction, a lot of companies have got their digital channels well established for marketing. They've automated and digitized various workflows and processes. They're getting on top of data and analytics to make data-driven decisions. They're thinking in a customer-centric fashion um, and, and moving in that direction. But the real benefit of organizational change around adaptability, agility, shared insights and capability are less well established and developed. So there are some building blocks there, but there's a lot of work to go to move true organizational change beyond um, just the, the tech function or the IT function. And this, I think, is one of the, the most interesting charts in the report where we've asked companies which two C-suite executives are most influential in driving digital initiatives within their organizations. And we can see the chief technology officer came out of top, uh, on top with just over half of respondents. And that was a, something of a surprise to us given that the audience we surveyed uh, is quite steeped in, in marketing. Um, Chief Marketing Officer down at 24%, and in between those, the CEO with 34%. And that, that's something that hopefully will be looked at in the, in the panel discussion, where who needs to be driving this digital change within the organization. Another key strand of the research was the identification of digital leaders and um, an analysis of the, the characteristics and attitudes of those organizations and, and how they differ from the rest of the survey sample, what we've called the mainstream. So we classified leaders as those who describe their digital initiatives and programs as very successful and also regard their digital maturity either as developed or advanced relative to others in the same business sector as them. So this isn't perfect because this is companies giving their own perspective on how developed and mature they are, but works quite well as a, a lens through which to, to view some of the findings of the report and see, as, as I say, see what leaders are doing differently. This chart shows what companies think as the regard as the most important metrics for measuring the success of their digital initiatives. And we can see here that leaders are significantly more likely to be predominantly measuring customer experience through metrics like CSAT and uh, MPS and also employee experience, whereas mainstream businesses are more likely to be measuring success based on uh, the top line and the bottom line, uh, that's obviously revenues and, and reducing costs. And so the difference here is that leaders are, are thinking about being more customer centric and then waiting for the, uh, waiting for, to reap the benefits of that in terms of the, the all-important commercial benefits, whereas the mainstream are thinking from the, from, the, from the start just about the top and bottom line.
Another big difference between leaders and the mainstream is uh, their view on whether they have the right kind of capabilities and skill sets within the organization. So leaders significantly more likely to have the right balance of capabilities across product design, technology, and data-driven insights. They're also more likely to have the right organizational structure and culture to adapt quickly to seize new opportunities. And they're also more successful at balancing the art and science of digital, digital evolution. So balancing, I guess, creative thinking um, and approaches based on data science and AI. So that's the, I guess, the balance essentially of left brain and right brain thinking within the business. So just, um, just to conclude my presentation here, there's a quote here from Peter Abraham, who is a, an author and digital consultant. As he says here, there's no end to digital transformation, just constant change and evolution. Agility in its broadest sense, to move quickly and easily is the only way to embrace that change. Testing and learning, iterating and improving. It's no longer about big projects and big bets, but rather smaller, faster iterations that counter the change. Okay, that concludes my um, part of this morning session. And I think we can now move on to the panel. Thank you. As Linus said, the hypothesis that we started off with with this report was that we're moving from an, an age when, we, when companies think about digital transformation uh, as something that is, that is a journey from point A to point B, that uh, as one of, the, uh, one of the contributors to the report said, that at some point there's a ribbon cutting ceremony and, um, and everybody goes woo hoo and uh, digital transformation's done, um, what are we gonna do now? Um, and now we, we're moving into a time when people think that, you know, that, that, that change is constant, change is, and, 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 the, and the mindset that needs to be achieved is one of readiness uh, to move on, uh, to, to respond to change. And we, opt, we adopted this, the, the metaphor of evolution um, in a slightly different way, I suspect, to the way Darwin originally meant it. In biological evolution, company, uh, uh, or, uh, organisms, <laughs> blimey, uh, organisms are, um, the, the, the organisms that are most suited to the new environment are the ones that survive best. What we're saying here is that the organizations that, um, that are most ready to change are the ones that will survive best, hence the survival of the quickest. Um, it turned out to be a bit more complicated than that, in that we found a lot, as Linus has shown, we found a lot of people who, are, who say they're thinking in terms of digital evolution, but are still at a stage where, actually, when you, take, when you lift the bonnet, they're still very much just digitizing. And so I guess what I, the first place to start is, um, is what does this mean? Dom, you know, do, so, so A, was our, um, our original thesis correct? And B, you know, how much does it matter if, if people are, are not yet at this, evolu in this evolutionary mindset? Um, well, I think, I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the answer is different from what, depending on what organization and what sector you operate in. Um, I think that for, I mean, one of the things that is true is that the pace of change is increasing all the time. As I, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are seeing more and more of that. And, and I think well, the organizations that have been, there, there's, a, only a, there's a limit to how successful you can be with this kind of program-based approach. A lot of organizations were starting from kind of coming from behind in terms of needing to catch up, needing to get the basic systems, technologies, capabilities in place to be able to publish a website, to be able to connect a digital experience with an offline experience, to get their CRMs in, in order and all that kind of stuff, to get a general picture. 
but that's kind of made them suited to 2004 or something. I mean, you know, and that's, and that's great and fine, but that's a great foundation. But in terms of the, the environment we find ourselves in now, where whole industries have been completely transformed in the space of a year, so through COVID, through you know, all, the, all the changes that have taken place, um, in a sense, you've got to be now, if you're gonna flourish, uh, you need to almost anticipate the change. So the, the target is running away from you kind of faster than you can catch it up. And in a sense, that's inevitable and that's okay. And I think you know, the, 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 all you can really do is build the capabilities to be able to be as adaptive and agile and free to experiment as you possibly can. Um, and that isn't just about technology and processes. That's also about the culture. It's about the kind of people you hire. It's about the kind of way that you motivate and incentivize your people. And it's more than anything, I feel, it isn't being looked at. It's about the kind of way that you lead and run your businesses. So when, when people, you know, we, we, we often talk to clients and kind of have this conversation around, you know, how do I become digitally innovative? Well, actually, it's not something that you can sort of set at the C-suite level and just tell everyone to do. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you need to look at right from the, you know, from, the, from the point of leadership and start it at all levels. It needs to start at the ground level in terms of freeing up your people to be able to do, um, you know, to be able to have an idea, try it out and fail. Um, at the middle level in terms of all the infrastructure to enable that, but also at the, at the leadership level to be able to actually change the culture of the business to enable you to take those risks to not be afraid. And I've, you know, seen it again and again, particularly in financial services, where there is just this kind of, we don't want to fail, you know, and actually you're going to have to fail to get there. So, you know, that's kind of my view on it. Kyra, I know you, you think about this stuff a lot. Yeah, I think, you know, as Dom said, it's the, the pace of change is just pretty, oh, hello, it's pretty overwhelming. I mean, you're not only competing with, um, you know, the likes of Netflix and Spotify and Amazon in terms of providing a, a really exciting customer experience, you're also trying to be ahead of your customers' expectations, right? And you can't do that by copying other companies or other organizations. You have to do that by trying to be a front runner, which requires a lot of experimentation. And that can be really uncomfortable. And one of the things we found in, in the report and through the research is that people are scared to experiment. Um, and I think that really comes down to two reasons. One that we found in, in the research is that there's not enough C-level sponsorship. There's not C-level support. Um, there's not a culture of experimentation. But two, I think people feel that experimenting, or digital teams especially feel that experimenting is, uh, is risky. It's a step in the dark, right? But it, it doesn't have to be that. You can still experiment um, and take risks based on your data but you have to have more than just the raw data, right? You have to have insights into what um, you know, type of hypothesis you might be able to test. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's really a shame, I think, that teams are uh, experiencing a lot of fear when it comes to this because it is the only way forward, right? I mean, you're competing with your customers' um, best experience they've ever had. Um, that's really what you have to try to provide. Dean? Um what does what does a what does a business look like? What what is there a model for what for what a business should look like to deliver this kind of this kind of support, this kind of you know, experiment first attitude? I just want to note that I've avoided putting that coffee cup down because by putting it down, I've guaranteed I'm going to kick it over at some point. I don't know how my feet are going to find that coffee cup, but I'm interested to find out. <laughs> I think what was great about this report is, I think this was fundamentally a report on digital leadership, much more than digital transformation. Um, I don't know about you, but I am ready to put that term to rest, digital transformation. I think we can be done with that now. Um, I don't think, I think it was a term that everybody loved because everybody loves the idea of a transformation, right? It's a classic marketing term. Everybody loves to transform. But I, a transformation is a series of smaller steps. And I think that the key to an organization um, progressing and evolving is, I, I want to put the word humility on it. Um, it's funny, Kyra, you said that nobody wants to, people are scared to experiment. I think people are scared to experiment because they're desperately afraid they're going to be proven wrong and they don't want to look like they don't have the answer. In this industry, everybody is supposed to know everything and you're never supposed to show weakness and you're never supposed to know that we don't know the answer and let's try something. And so I think 
the number one thing an organization could do is you just instill a culture of humil humility that we don't have the answers, but we're willing to find out. I, I think if there's one personality trait organizationally that could help, it'd be that. And I guess the other the other question that struck me, you know, thinking about this, you know, we, we've seen the um, the difference Linus has, has illustrated between digitally native businesses and and established concerns. Can can we get there from here? Can 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 a a an established business turn itself into something that looks di digitally native? Uh, yes, is the. Yeah, yes, the answer to that is, um, I think, um, because we've seen it time and time again. This isn't just the preserve of, you know, the Hoxton-based trendy startups. It, it's, it's, it, you know, you've, you've seen, we've been, you know, in this, in this process now for long enough to see large-scale organizations pivot from being kind of top-down um, to being much more kind of federated, self-governed, um, prepared to experiment. Um, I mean, you know, there are they're, they're like organizations like Sky who, who set up Now TV. And I think one of the things that they said uh, as the brief for that was, you know, go and, go and build the business that will destroy this one, you know, but we'll own it. Because otherwise, if you don't own the business that will destroy you, someone else sure as hell will. So, you know, and, and I think there's, there's something quite powerful in that message. And I'm not suggesting everyone goes off and does that. But, but there's something quite powerful in that message around, you know, being prepared to look at things in such a different way and build and uh, give people the freedom to um, to be able to make those you know to try things out and make those and make those mistakes that you can culturally do within large organizations there are lots of you know different schools of thoughts around how you do this there's the kind of dual transformation christiansen uh, approach and others where you know you can either create a, 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 an external part of the business or do it internally depending on the conditions um, but i think the answer to that is 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 yes but you do need to be prepared as the guys were saying, to look at it at all levels. So leadership and um, in terms of capabilities at the front line, and also in terms of making sure you've got the right data and the right systems to be able to get you the information so you can make sensible evidence-based decisions that you can justify. I love that quote, build a, build a business that will destroy your business. I think that reminds me of in the intelligence community, kind of the CIA and, and global intelligence, they have what they call red teams. Red teams are internal teams that try to destroy other teams' plans. So if somebody has come up with a plan to accomplish something, probably sinister, uh, there's a red team that specifically tries to poke holes in that and break that plan. And I wonder if we could use to have red teams at our organizations. Would it help to take a team for six months and try to come up with a business model that would destroy your current business model? Would that be an educational experience? Would that give you some new insight on your industry? I, I think there's value there. So picking up on something you just, you just said, uh, Dom, um, one of the problems that came up very clearly in the report was, was the question of, of shared data. You know, data, not so much a problem, sharing that data and, and using it to create, to create value, to create a, uh, you know, the, the much lauded single customer view is, is still a problem. Um, what... What do businesses need to do to, to, to move on? What do you, how do you, you know, for people who are, lo are looking at this for the, for the uh, you know, what do they do tomorrow? What do you do tomorrow? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer what you do tomorrow. Um, I think you start a conversation tomorrow um, at, at all of these levels. But I think in terms of what I've seen before is that, again, the data question is, 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 is kind of threefold. Firstly, having the systems that will make the data available. So are you measuring the right things? Have you connected your CRM with your web analytics? All of that kind of basic hygiene stuff that still a lot of people are a, a, little, bit, a little bit away from and still need to do some work. But the, and, and, and that's really important. And obviously, you need the technology community within your organization to support that and all the rest of it. But there's another part of it that I think people don't quite, you know, sometimes struggle with understanding, which is that if you're going to get a single view of your customer or of your situation or of your market or whatever, you need to have the leaders of the different parts of the business, production, service, delivery, marketing, communications, whatever they are, looking at the same things. And the problem is, is that if we're all incentivized to look at different things, communication and marketing are looking at reach, 
you know, sales are looking at revenue, um, service delivery are looking at lower costs, then you're all going to be looking for different things in the data. So what you need to do is agree on, this, on, 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 a, on a common set of things that you're looking for. So you might have the infrastructure in place, but that you need to, you need to understand what it is that, um, what it is that, that, that these trends look like. Um, and, and a lot of that can come from kind of, you know, uh, customer insights, um, mapping your, your customer journeys, um, and also having a close and meaningful uh, involvement of customer groups within the organization. So not just, you know, a, a focus group once in a while every six months, but actually having them intimately involved so that you're having those conversations and you can start to see um, iteratively what are the kind of behaviors and indicators that are likely to suggest the kind of behavior you're trying to you're trying to uh, you're trying to, to drive and and that's something I still think a lot of organizations are struggling with so get the data in place but also work with the owners of the different parts of the business to get them involved in not just getting dashboards or reports on what they care about now but decide on what you think is going to be important in the future and get dashboards and the and the reporting and and and, and that built into the culture that you're living and breathing every day. How much of this comes to the way you set your, the way you set targets for people? Um, Kyra, do you, do, you have a, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I would just echo what Don says, that I think the, the qualitative element is actually much undervalued. We've talked a lot about data, but I think oftentimes teams are overloaded with data and they, they, they're drowning. It's like you know drinking from a fire hose. They don't, they don't know what to do with it. And actually what we've seen when we talk to a lot of our customers is what's missing is that qualitative element. So really talking with uh, you know, customers or focus groups or whatever, trying to understand what, but what does this mean, right? What, what actually matters to you? What can we you know, see from the data, but also adding that human, human element to it. So I think you know, when we're talking about setting targets, it's really important not to lose sight of the the human elements at the end of that, right? So um, yes, our target might be to generate more, you know, marketing qualified leads, but in addition to that, how can we create, you know, this this experience that solves this pain point for this customer? So I think adding, you know, that that human element is really important and, and using your team's abilities um, to solve problems. We, you know, sometimes we, I think we get so focused on data, we forget that, it, intuition matters right that gut, gut feeling on like i think we should try this because it just feels right it feels like it might address this customer's need and, and making space for that when we set targets is important i think this goes back in organizations we have a problem that i call the psychology of repository permanence uh, an organization any organization has too many repositories too many locations for data and your employees have become cynical about where you're going to put your data um, we add new systems all the time and we tell our employees, okay, now we're going to be using this system. And they're like, okay, well, how long are we going to be doing this? Three months, six months until we move on to the next thing. So when you talk about a single source of truth, you're smiling now, I can see that. When you talk about a single source of truth, it absolutely has to come from the top down. It, it's a psychology problem with your employees. They will not buy into a single source of truth unless the entire organization does, and the entire organization won't do it unless it comes from the top down. There's a great book by Patrick Lencioni called The Advantage, which is about organizational health, and he makes the case over about 300 pages that the absolute number one benefit to an organization is to have everybody headed in the right direction, and to do that, it has to come from the top. You have to have leadership around this. You cannot have a single source of truth that doesn't come from the top down, I believe. I think, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think another thing uh, around this, just to add, is, is how it needs to be balanced. So, and this might seem kind of strange thing to say, but if you're going to be introducing new systems and new ways of working, get the basic things right. So this kind of concept of T-shaped or pie-shaped transformation is known, but it can still be evolution. The idea that you, if you're going to go deep with data or you're going to go deep with, with, with CRM systems and customer view, then get other systems working right. If you're going to introduce new ways of working to people, make sure that the expenses system is simple to use or that the timesheet system is simple to use because it's very difficult to culturally change an organization if there are things that are in the way every day or that teams work. I know this sounds daft, but I've seen it time and time again. It's really hard to build cultural change when you don't have, you know, you kind of got to pay for it. 
Here's a new system. We're going to try, you know, we're going to try working in new ways. You're going to need to change the way that you work. And in return for that, we're also investing in things that mean that matter to you now to make your job easier now. And I think that's something that kind of can get lost. We can get a bit too like down in the specialism, and you need to kind of deliver simple value for everybody. You know, make it easy to update a web page, make it easy to add a new product to the catalog, you know, and your e-commerce system. I I call this case study syndrome. I think we all have case study syndrome and it's LinkedIn's fault. We go out to LinkedIn and people uh, post case studies and blog posts and articles about all these amazing things that they're doing. And what we don't realize is there's a publication bias there. Nobody talks about the things that didn't work out or the things that just worked out okay. And because of this, we have this mental image of everybody else being amazing. And so what that means, Dom, is that we're all paranoid about being amazing and we don't bother to check if we're any good. We don't stop to do the absolute basics because we are absolutely determined to be incredible and we don't check that, that we're just doing the basic things right. So um, handle the unglamorous basics that you aren't going to tell people about on LinkedIn and then uh, move on to the more advanced stuff. And I think that's also really important for upper leadership as well, right? To have leaders in place who, who are willing to do the unglamorous work because like leadership in and of itself is often... Uh, not this. <laughs> it's often really unglamorous, right? But it's important to set the tone by by doing those things that aren't so exciting, but just need to get done and, and provide a you know, better experience for your customers and for your employees and your teams. I always maintain that things like analytics should be exciting. like like They should be boring like a trip to the dentist is boring. If you go to see the dentist and you have a boring experience at the dentist, that's great. If anybody comes back from the dentist and says, oh, my trip to the dentist was really exciting, that's never good. You never want an exciting trip to the dentist. So things like analytics, things like repositories, that should be boring like a trip to the dentist. If nobody has anything to report, congratulations, you did a great job. Which kind of leads us on to, to one of the other ideas that cropped up, or one of the things that Linus highlighted from the, from the report, which is, which is the question of who leads the process. You know, this notion that the, the CTO is the, is, the, is the driver of change in the organization, um, you know, as, as Linus said, took us by surprise. Um, what, what are the implications of that and what needs, what needs to change? And I guess the other, the other question, the other thing that struck me as Linus was talking is, you know, um, you know I, I'm a media and marketing journalist. I'm used to marketers saying that they should be in charge of, of digital transformation, that it's an, an opportunity for marketers to, 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 sh to shine. Is that just what marketers would say? As someone in marketing, I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm a bit biased because I, I've always worked in marketing and Sight Improve is for marketing teams, but I do, I do think it's a huge opportunity missed, right? If CMOs are not leading the charge on digital, how can they possibly expect to provide a digitally competitive experience? Um, but I, I also think it's important not to frame it as a competition, right? Internally, like who's, who's at the front of implementing digital, but um, I was surprised. A little bit shocked. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this plays into this, this thing that we've been talking about, about balance again. I mean, obviously, in a marketer's DNA, there's going to be a little bit of ta-da and kind of wanting to, wanting to talk, communicate, and, 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 and be outward looking. And being outward looking is really important and has benefits because traditionally being outward looking, if you can wear your transformation or, or, or development on the outside, share prices go up, customers get engaged. All of those traditional metrics will change in a positive way that gets you to keep your job. And as I say, the boring stuff doesn't get looked at very often. So I think, yes, there is, there is an element of that. But I think also it's, it's, it's you know, this is, you know, where, where does this conversation need to happen? Yes, CMOs need to, need to be involved, but also it's, it's, it's across the whole of, the, of leadership. I, you know, it, it, there is nothing probably more important than, present, uh, than, than positioning your organization to be able to face the future. And if everyone at the C-suite level isn't looking at that, I, you know, they pro you know, there's probably a, a, some conversation to be had there, but this is what this is about now. It's about positioning your organization for the future. Are there any CTOs in the room? Okay, I'm sorry in advance, but unless your company's product is technology, the CTO is a support role. Uh, if your product does anything but technology, then it's the CTO's job to support the rest of the business. So the most surprising finding of the report, and I guess 
I don't want to use the word disappointing, but the most concerning one to me is that CTOs are leading so many initiatives. Um, with all respect to our friend here, um, his job is to support the rest of the organization. When it comes to marketing technology, I would hope those initiatives are driven by the CMO and supported by the CTO rather than being driven by the CTO. So that, that was very surprising to me. So is there a model, is there a single model for what this, for what this leadership should look like? Or, or does it vary completely uh, by sector, by maturity? Um, can, can you say to people, you know, this is how you should, because I think one of the things that struck me over the last few months is that, is that everybody's talking about change, but it seems to be very much about changing from rather than changing to. And that the you know somebody like you know Mark Mark Evans at Direct Line you know talks very much and very and very passionately about about adopting agile methodologies for, within the Direct Line marketing department, but is is there a model for what for what a, an agile enterprise might look like? It's very you know it feels to me like it's it's very easy to say you have to change, but it's much harder to say what. You know, this is this is this is something that you might aspire to. This is a structure. This is a a, a set of relationships that will that will support the kind of change you need. Uh, yeah, um, that that's a tough question, and I think the winners are the ones who are looking. The, the, you know, the, the organisations that are being successful are the ones that are looking at it from the point of view of the outcomes they're trying to get to or the outcomes they're trying to achieve rather than necessarily thinking that they know uh, inflexibly the ways that they're going to get there. So by that I mean avoiding this kind of three-year program for IT transformation or marketing transformation or whatever um, and looking and being able to kind of disconnect what we're trying to become as a business with how we're going to get there. And the way that you do that is by building in, and I don't like this term agile because everyone sees this term agile as meaning something different. Really what it's about is it's about being open-minded about how you get there, I think, and, and looking at different ways of doing that. So if you're able to, you know, quarterly or even better, monthly, review um, and set, sort of identify a set of hypotheses, we think that if we do this, then this will result in a measurable improvement in revenue, in reducing customer churn, in acquisition of new customers or whatever, you know, um, value of the company. Um, and then trying that and being open and, uh, being open and able to be experimental around that. That's, and, and having that at all these different levels of the organization through leadership, through middle management and through frontline is, is probably the key, I think. Um, and there are models uh, uh, and, 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 and sort of terms of reference that you can do to set that up. And that could be different for each organization in financial services. It can be, it's very different from it is in kind of, you know, service industries, for example. But I think broadly what you're doing there is you're, about, you're keeping your eyes very clearly on the outcomes, but you're very flexible, more flexible about what initiatives and hypotheses you're going to use to drive to get there. I have a lot to say about this. We have, there's, a, there's an anecdote, the streetlight problem. So a man is looking for his keys underneath a streetlight and someone comes to help him. And he says, well, I actually lost my keys on the other side of the street. And he says, well, why are you looking here? And he says, well, because the light's better over here. And this is what we do in business. We try to organize problems to find the solutions that we want to find. And so when you were talking about models, you know, what model of an organization solves this problem. I think everybody was thinking functional models, reporting lines, org charts, organizational design, and we automatically default that because that's something that we understand and we feel like we can change and that will help us solve the problem. But I think the real problem is leadership, and leadership is something that we often don't want to look at because it's fuzzier and it's more complicated and it's harder to solve. Um, you can have the greatest organizational reporting structure in the world, a bad leader will destroy that organization. And the opposite is also true. If you have a beloved leader who trusts their people and who looks for the best in their people and gives their people what they feel is the psychological freedom to make mistakes and to make decisions, that organization will thrive. If you get a chance, Google did a uh, research project called Project Aurora, 
where they looked at high-performing teams and they reviewed all the characteristics of, characteristics of teams that made them high-performing. And the number one thing they found was what they called psychological safety. People on teams that performed well felt safe to make decisions and to lead and to make changes because if they knew they failed, but they made a genuine attempt at it, they wouldn't be punished or penalized or ostracized from the group for that. And that goes back to basic human leadership. And that's what I think is missing. We look for the solution to our problems underneath the street light because the light is good. Unfortunately, we lost our keys on the other side of the street and we need to start looking there. I, that psychological safety thing is interesting because I, I think it was the same study I was looking at and they were talking a lot about how do you create that psychological safety. And one of the things they found is teams that have it actually talk, I think it's for every five work conversations they have, they have six personal conversations, which seems really counterintuitive in some ways, but it is, I think, great leadership and great teams and teams that are willing to take risks and experiments. Um, it's surprising sometimes how you create them. The problem is, the problem is then you have people talking about how they're going to knock their coffee cup over. So that's the problem there. Yeah, because there, there's a there's a similar to, similar to that. There's I remember reading about a, a study that was done of um, success of musicals, and the most successful musical ever is uh, is West Side Story, and and they and the, the, the research analyzed what you tried to analyze what made up the uh, the the requirements of a, of, a, of a successful musical. And that what they found was that most of the team have to have worked together before and have to have, have, to, have, um, have to know each other well. But you need just enough of a wild card to spark everything, to spark, every, to, to spark everybody up. And, and in the case of West Side Story, everybody had worked together on previous shows apart from Stephen Sondheim who was completely new. There's this sense that, um, that, that you, need, you need familiarity, but you also need, you know, uh, something to just, to, to just spark, um, to just spark new thinking and, and, and to, keep people, to keep people engaged and excited. Um, and that's, I mean, that seems to me to be, you know, quite crucial in managing teams, but something that is not, something that, 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 that kind of is, I guess, going back to your point, Dean, which is about leadership. It's not about structure. I saw a negative review of the new Batman movie, and the review started out, um, the Batman has all of the ingredients of a good movie. Unfortunately, we don't eat ingredients, we eat meals, right? It didn't really come together. It's it, the word ineffable, that's a word, right? She, she does content, so I had to check with her to make sure I got the word right. Ineffable, right? It's the thing that you cannot grasp. What's the French phrase? Je ne sais quoi, the thing that you just don't know. And that's leadership, and that's humanity. And I, I think in our organizations today, we try to solve problems with organizational design and software, where we should be concentrating more on human processes and human leadership. I'm the software guy. I shouldn't be talking. I think this is showing that the change is happening. I hope so. Uh, yeah. But then the other, so to, to, just, to, just to sort of throw another, another idea out, um, I was reading something a little while ago about, about fighter plane design, and one of, the, one of the things they talk about is, is how in order to be maneuverable, fighter planes have to be built to be inherently unstable, so they're incredibly difficult to fly, um, but they're incredibly maneuverable as a result. Is there an analogy there with business? Are we, tr um, you know, we, the business structures we've had um, have worked for a, a very long time over periods which could be described as equally exciting, uh, traumatic, change-driven as, as the ones we're in now. Um, are we, do we risk jettisoning uh, stability uh, uh, in the search of maneuverability? Uh, well, that, that's, that, yeah, I mean, I think everyone's story is individual, uh, every organization's story is individual, and actually having the, the, the appetite at leadership level and across the organization to be able to engage in that journey of discovery. You can't read, I mean, there's only so much you can read in, in a management book or learn at Harvard, you know, Harvard Business School, whatever, around this stuff. You have to go out there and actually start practicing it and, 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 and discovering it for yourself. So that's the first thing is be, you know, is, is, is 
participate in the change, you know, start to practice uh, the, the, these approaches. But also, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, the, this inherent un instability, um, th there's a project I worked on um, a few years ago with a financial services organization in Europe who said to me, Don, we want to build a rebel bank, um, but we're kind of seen as the most sort of traditional bank in that territory. So they were kind of struggling and they'd done all this kind of work around trying to you know, roll out innovation and what innovation meant and trying to figure this out for ages. And actually what we realized was that the answer wasn't actually for them to try and culturally change themselves from the top down, but, but was instead to open a center for innovation where they partnered with their uh, perceived competition. And what we said, to, what we recommended to them was go out and find a space for your competition, um, these kind of fintech, disruptive fintech startups from, from, from Israel, a lot of them, um, and, and invite them over here to build, you know, give them free coffee, Wi-Fi, and, and, and buy 10% of the, you know, give them a 10% um, funding to get them up and running so that you're actually partnering with, your, with what you're afraid of move towards what you're afraid of. Now, that didn't mean them re-engineering their business from the ground up and breaking all the organizational concrete, which is another wonderful term I really like, this idea of having to break organizational concrete. But it was about create a safe space where you can bring in people who are potentially disruptive and, and who are going to kind of, by osmosis, change the way you work. Um, but you don't have to necessarily... That's one example. There might be another example where you need to, you know, as I say, build the organization that might destroy your own. But I think it's about, it's about you know, starting on that journey and seeing that there are, you know, there are several different ways of doing this. But start. You don't need to do it all. You shouldn't try and do it all in a year. But you should try and set yourself the outcome of that we'll have made a significant, you know, we'll have got somewhere in a year. But Dom, we need to do transformation. Well, I think the point is, what we're saying here is we need to do evolution. Remember? No, yeah. we have to transform in 30 days or, yeah. or we failed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we've come to the end of the, the, at the, end of the session. Um, do we have time for questions? Yeah, uh, so we have, we have time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. If anybody's got anything that they'd like to contribute, um, Hello there. Thank you for your presentation. You have um, to have it right up close to your, your mouth. Right up. Um, in the arts sector, they're looking at getting rid of the word digital completely. I don't really think it's a, a useful term anymore. And in public service as well. And I would just wonder what you think about that, that whether, how much language has to play in the barrier of, of getting to somewhere different. I know we're all waiting to use the same David Foster Wallace analogy, right? Oh, I, w I wasn't going to, but if you're bringing up infinite jest, then that's very no, impressive. No, David Foster Wallace, he did in 2005, he did the um, commencement address for Kenyon College, his alma mater, and he had a story about two fish were swimming along, and an older fish came by and said, hey boys, how's the water? And they kept swimming along, and like five minutes later, one of them said, what the hell's water? Right? Because when you're into something, it loses its meaning. Right? A fish doesn't know what water is. That's just what it exists in. And so when you talk about getting rid of the word digital, at what point is digital the assumption? Right? I mean, I almost think we should talk about printed. When my mother, uh, my late mother, got a digital camera, the number one thing she wanted to know was, how do I print the pictures out? Because she wanted the printed pictures. And the idea of printing a digital picture to me was just bizarre. And like. She would give me pictures she had taken of my kids, like physical pictures, and I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Right? I don't want the physical picture, I want the digital picture, because digital is really becoming the default. So I, I think that's very interesting, and I think that's very true, and the fact is, uh, you know, what the hell is water? That's we're getting the point, there's gonna be a point where people say, what is non-digital? Like, what is that? I think it's also, I agree with you, but I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops post COVID. I mean, this is not a digital event, right? We're here in person. So is there a slight reorientation back towards in-person, towards tangible and concrete? I don't know. Um, I mean, to answer, it is interesting. I was involved in a, in, a, in a piece of work about 10 years ago that I think was called something like Digital is Dead, 
you know, long live digital, but the idea is that there's that digital as being a separate thing kind of even 10 years ago, we should kind of have stopped talking about. We don't have a telephone department, do we? You just pick up the phone, you do your printing, you, you, you have conversations, you don't go through to a central team to do that for you. And I think that's one of the things, that particularly, you know, one of the things in digital, if we're gonna call it that, um, and we have to call it something, is that, um, is that, you know, it's about building the capabilities so people know the basic capabilities to be able to do, you know, to be able to communicate with people. And most communication, most first touch points with an organization is through your, the website, through social media or whatever, you know. But, but I think, yes. And I think what we're saying here in this report and what, we talked, what we've been talking about today is that actually it's more about culture. It, there are elements of technology. There are elements of things you might call digital in terms of, you know, content the writing for the web, all, all of that sort of stuff. But really, this is about building a culture where people can try stuff out quickly because what digital enables you to do is be very responsive and rapidly, you know, rapidly get stuff out there into the market that could respond to, and, uh, uh, to, to changing conditions. So I think, yeah, 100%, but we have to kind of call it something and maybe we haven't quite yet figured out the right thing to call it, but I'm, I'm completely with you that we maybe, we won't say transformation again, we won't say digital again, we all can agree that, never to mention those two words again after we've left this room. But I feel like we should take this opportunity, Dom, to settle our bed. Has anyone in the room actually read Infinite Jest? Oh, bravo, sir. Thanks, thanks for ruining that one. We had a bet that no one had ever actually read it. I think, I think some of the ways it's being positioned in the conversations I've been involved with is that it's, um, it's a tool among others. So it's a, it's a mode to get you there. So it, it's like we're looking at a customer journey or an experience of which digital is a mode to help you get there. So things like role names, I sort of say, I'm removing the word digital and then looking more at what is it that digital's enabling. And it's that shift of language that's interesting to me. It's, it's interesting that because I think when you look at the really successful organizations that often are digital, they don't have, they won't have a chief digital officer or a head of digital. They'll have a head of growth or a head of acquisition or a head of customer experience. Um, and there'll be people there who are responsible for kind of outcomes rather than departments. Having a head of digital is what well, head of what, the, the digital what? Digital success, digital acquisition, digital reduction in costs, what? Head of digital? Um, and I know there are a lot of, you know, I've been one, guilty, you know, well, you know, I'm sure there are lots of us here, but what does that, you know, and, and this is why it's really important for organizations to understand what it means, why you have, need to have a solid strategy which has a digital element to it. Again, I'm not even sure that we're in a world of digital strategy anymore because digital strategy is just probably your strategy, actually. Um, so, yeah, so, so it, organizations that tend to be successful tend to be the ones that have um, role names or roles around outcomes rather than departments. Does anyone here have the title Chief Digital Officer? Oh, thank goodness, because I hate that title. Like, what does that even mean, Chief Digital Officer? So I was hoping no one here would take offense at that. Anybody else uh, want to add something? Yes, someone, someone gentleman at the back. What's really interesting is we talk mostly here about really it's facilitating the culture of change. And research that I've looked into a few years ago around the chief digital officer was that primarily they're a cultural change officer. I mean, rarely it's through actually the technology itself. But what's interesting is we don't talk much about the use of HR in any of this. And if we're talking about cultural change, yeah. We need to sell software, we need to get to the top, put it through everything. Surely, a big stakeholder here is HR. What do you guys think? What did you find? Is it because you're sitting next to our CHRO? <laughs> I, I feel like you're in HR. <laughs> I'm not, but you're sitting next to me. No, I, I, it's a really good point, and I think it's something that, um, yeah, so Britt, our CHRO, is here. Welcome, Britt. Um, but I, I think it's something that at least I feel our HR department is, is really thinking about and looking into. I mean, it is when we're talking about a culture um, of change, of resilience, of um, robustness, that's really important, right? So you can hire for those things. You can try to hire for flexibility. I mean, it's, it's certainly something that we try to do at Sight and Proof. Um, 
change is part of the game, it's part of our DNA, and we, we screen for that when we hire to make sure that people can, they are robust enough to withstand that change, and, and not only withstand it, but, you know, what is that phrase, like, the big strong oak will break in the wind, but the willow is flexible enough that it uh, bends, right? And that's, that's really important for our internal culture, because um, things not only change, but people, people have to be able to uh, embrace that and adapt to it and, and lead the charge, you know, when we change direction. So I think it is, it's a huge part of, you know, the hiring strategy and um, internal culture building. I've always been slightly uncomfortable with the term human resources. There's something slightly, I don't know, kind of commodified about that. I mean, I think it's interesting when you have a head of talent or a head of community or a head of culture, um, and I think that these are the kind of words that need to be driving, as you say, flexible, the flexibility, the right kind of people, the right kind of, you know, fear, sorry, the, the removing the fear of failure, um, this, this psychological safety that you're talking about, I think, I think it's really important. And I think it's also, you know, this goes back to strengthening this idea that it is the responsibility or the conversation needs to be happening with everyone in, 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 the, in the organization. It is not just technology and the digital head of or officer of or whatever we're calling them. Um, it's a conversation that if you're going to prepare your organization for the future, um, which is what we're doing here, you need everybody on the bus. So I, I share your concern about the term human resources, but human resources is better than human capital. Have you heard some more? What a horrible human capital. I feel like it's the CEO's job to set culture. With all due respect to our friends in human resources, uh, culture has to come from the top down. It has to come from the CEO. And I feel like if you have something like a chief cultural officer or an office of cultural change, you've probably already lost if that's not coming down from the, uh, from the very top. So what's interesting is that I would say 90% of the comments in this panel came down to leadership, culture, and human behavior, uh, which goes back to the point that we try to solve things under the streetlights we're comfortable with. Lady there. So um, I think instead of HR, it's probably change management, and I'd like to see more chief governance officers because they're the ones that have to deal with, and I'm thinking of the, um, you know, when you're dealing with a city or a, a county or, you know, some government. So as soon as you start changing anything, it's like, that's not my job description. I'm part of the union. If you're going to have me put things into the CMS, I want more money. It's like, it's supposed to be their job. So you get lots of governance aspects of it. And HR tends to be more reactive as opposed to the change management people who have to fix culture and, and so on. And that's a skill set unto its own. Like, I can't think of any CEO who kind of goes like, oh yeah, I'm going to get involved in this. They go like, I, I don't want to deal with this. Like you deal with it. So uh, I think that, that the rise of some sort of a governance board or a, you know, a, a governance leader is, is probably on the horizon. So Rahel Bailey is the queen of web governance, and I'm not going to argue with her. So. Yeah, I mean, I think just, just to add to that, I think one of, one of the things, the programs that we've worked on or the partnerships that we've worked on that are the most successful ones have a governance, a digital governance aspect to them. Um, you know, often clients come to us wanting us to build them a thing. That's great. We're very happily, we'll very, you know, happily build you a thing. But, but what comes around that thing is how's the organization going to change? How are you going to evolve that thing and improve it once you've built it? Um, don't spend all the money that you have available on just building the thing. Save at least half of it for then improving the thing. Because what people tell you during the discovery, and I'm the guy that leads discovery, what people tell you that they want and what they actually want are different things. In 2009, someone showed me an iPad. I thought it was rubbish. It was a rubbish TV and it was a rubbish computer. Now I can't live without them. So I have been changed by that. So, you know, what I would have said I would have wanted, which is a decent computer or a decent TV, please, not a kind of horrible hybrid of both, isn't actually what I ended up wanting. So when you put your product in the water and start sailing, that is when the learning really starts. So that's really important. And that's kind of, that's the stuff that feeds the governance. And from there you understand, you know, you can start to understand and have the conversation around how is this changing the way that we deliver services? How is this changing the way that we presenting our products, talking to our customers, learning and all these, what are the indications that we should be looking at? The things that we thought we should look at, such as the 
you know, whether it's cloudy or not, isn't necessarily an indication of what the weather's going to be like in a week's time. You start to look at something else. So as you learn, you start to realize that what you're measuring now may not actually be an indication of what you're looking to discover, if that makes sense. So yeah, completely agree with you that, that governance plays a huge role. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's, uh, that's all we have time for uh, in this session. Um, I think there's, there is some time still to, to, to mingle further and, and chat more. Um, but uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, Dean, Kyra, and Dom. <laughs>